Hi everyone. In this um, experiment, we're going to test the solubility rules that you may have learned in the lecture course. And we're also going to, at the same time, convert magnesium into uh, several different uh, magnesium compounds. And this is kind of a cool reaction because it's not every day that you take a piece of metal and you turn it into, you know, a white powder and then you make that white powder disappear and all this kind of stuff. So it's actually a visually interesting um, uh, representation of the solubility rules. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to turn magnesium metal, so a shiny ribbon of metal, into um, some magnesium salt, specifically magnesium chloride. So what we're going to do is we're going to react magnesium solid, which is elemental magnesium, with HCl aqueous, so hydrochloric acid dissolved in water. And when we do this, we're going to form magnesium chloride, MgCl2, which is aqueous, and hydrogen gas. Now, we need to be a little bit careful because hydrogen gas is flammable, but you're not going to make very much here. But it's important not to use an open flame uh, when you're in this lab because we don't want to light that hydrogen gas on fire. So basically, uh, this is our equation, but we need to balance this equation. And what we'll notice is we have 1H here and 2Hs here and 1Cl here and 2Cls here. So we actually need 2 hydrochloric acid to make this go. What's important from a solubility rules uh, perspective is that magnesium chlorides are soluble. And you may remember from your solubility rules that chloride salts are generally soluble. There are a few exceptions, such as lead and mercury and silver, but magnesium is no exception. So magnesium um, chloride becomes aqueous. So what are we going to actually see when we do this reaction? And Tim's going to do this reaction with you in just a few minutes. We're going to see shiny magnesium metal react with hydrochloric acid to form a soluble salt. So we'll go from soluble metal to solution. And we'll see one other thing. We'll see hydrogen gas forming. Well, gases are always less dense than liquids. So you're gonna see bubbles forming and those bubbles are hydrogen gas. So this is basically um, the first reaction that you're gonna do. And this is a single replacement or single displacement reaction. However, in order to do this reaction, we actually can't use the HCl you're provided in the lab. You have to use um, HCl that is diluted. So in the lab, you're going to find 5.0 molar HCl. And what you need is 20 mLs of 3.0 molar HCl. So in this experiment, you're going to add about six milliliters of HCl to your magnesium. However, you're going to do three trials. So you're going to have three flasks, each which contain around 0.1 grams of magnesium, and you're going to react all three of them. In order to do that, you're going to need about 20 milliliters of three molar HCl. Well, how are we going to turn five molar HCl into 20 milliliters of three molar HCl? Well, lucky for us, we have an equation that can help us do that. And that equation is called the dilution equation. Specifically, it is C1V1 equals C2V2, where C1 is the initial concentration and C2 is the final concentration. V1 is the initial volume and V2 is the final volume. In this case, the initial concentration is 5 molar because that's what you're provided with in the lab. Then we're going to need to know how much of that 5 molar HCl we should use. That's V1. C2 in this case is what we want, which is 3 molar. And the volume of 3 molar HCl that we want is 20 milliliters. So when we do this math, we find that V1 equals 12 um, milliliters of 5 molar HCl. But we want the total volume to be 20 milliliters. So what are we going to do with that 12 milliliters of 5 molar HCl? Well, we're going to add it to 8 milliliters of H2O, and that's what's going to dilute it. So the total volume will be 12 plus 8, which is 20 milliliters. Remember, when you're working with acids and water, it's always a good idea. In fact, in some cases, it's a super huge safety concern that we add the water to, um, excuse me, the acid to the water. 
we never add the water to the acid. Now, in the case of 5 molar HCl, if you add water to the acid, nothing horrible will happen. But if you had concentrated sulfuric acid and you pour water into it, um, it will splatter all over the place, and that's very dangerous because now you have splattering sulfuric acid. So always add acid to water. Do not add water to acid. So as Colin said, what I'm going to do now is show you the dilution making our... Uh, our hydrochloric acid, our 3 molar from 5 molar hydrochloric acid and water. What I've done is I've measured 8 milliliters of water into a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. And now I'm going to measure our calculated amount of HCl, which is 12 milliliters, into this 25 milliliter graduated cylinder using a pipette to transfer it. You'll notice that I am using two different graduated cylinders because we want to have our uh, HCl available to us to mix into our water. We don't want to be doing this directly because we need to make sure we have the correct amounts and we want to make sure we're adding our acid to our water in the end. So here you may not be able to see it very clearly on the video, but I have about now, I've got 12 milliliters of hydrochloric acid, 5 molar hydrochloric acid in my graduated cylinder and I've got 8 milliliters of water in my other graduated cylinder and now I'm going to mix those together in a small Erlenmeyer flask. So I'm going to put my water in first because remember we always want to add acid to water. We don't want to add water to acid. So I put my water in first, then I add my acid. I try to get those last couple extra drops and then I'm just going to give it a little swirl to make sure it's nice and stirred. So in a minute, Colin will go over the exact math of this equation with you and uh, show you the stoichiometry uh, so that you can calculate the theoretical yield. But while I'm here, I'm going to show you exactly what you're going to do for the first step. So you're going to weigh out about 0.1 grams of magnesium metal using a balance. Uh, it'll be a piece about this long, give or take. Uh, and we're going to put it into our 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. Now you'll notice I have it labeled with a mass, my 0 0.1070 grams uh, of magnesium, which is how much this piece of magnesium weighs. It's really important that you put the mass of your magnesium or another identifying label on each of the uh, flasks that you use so that you can definitely know which flask is which piece of magnesium because your pieces of magnesium are going to be different. So we're going to put our 0 0.1070 grams of magnesium into our flask labeled 0 0.1070 grams. In order to make sure that the reaction happens quickly, we're going to cut it up into little pieces uh, before we put it in there. So I'm just cutting up my magnesium into small bits. You'll want to do this uh, in a fairly clear part of your bench because as you can probably see, our magnesium bounces around a little bit as we cut it up. But once we have it cut up into pieces, we're going to take our pieces and put each of them into our flask. It doesn't matter exactly how big your pieces are, but cutting it up into several small pieces will speed up and make your reaction happen uh, better and more quickly. And then we're going to take our hydrochloric acid and we're going to put that into our, uh, our flask containing the HCl. So I've got here another graduated cylinder and I'm going to get my six milliliters that I'm supposed to put in to this flask and I'm going to measure that out using a clean pipette and I'm going to put six milliliters of my three molar HCl into this graduated cylinder like so. Then I'm going to leave the pipette in that Erlenmeyer flask so I know which one it is and I can do it for the other reactions. In this video, we're only going to show you one reaction, but in the lab, like I said before, you're going to have three different reactions, which is why it's important to label all of your Erlenmeyer flasks. So I'm going to take my six molars of three molar, six milliliters of three molar HCl, and I'm going to pour that into my flask. Now you can see there's a lot of bubbles forming. Colin mentioned this before, and that's because we're forming hydrogen gas when we react the magnesium with the hydrochloric acid. You'll see some of the gas coming out. That's okay, that's just hydrogen gas. We'll give it a little stir to make sure the magnesium 
is mixing thoroughly with the HCl. And as it reacts more and more, uh, the bubbles continue to form, uh, which you can see if I hold it. Uh, mm, you can't see it very well on the camera. Uh, sorry about that. But uh, you, can't, you will definitely be able to see when you do the reaction, you'll see bubbles forming on each piece of magnesium as it reacts with the HCl and forms the hydrogen gas. So now, a couple minutes later, we look at our uh, flask, and you can see on the camera, there is no metal magnesium solid left in the flask. So our first reaction is complete, and we'll be able to move on to the next reactions. Before I actually perform any of the other reactions, however, I'm going to send it back to Colin, and he's going to talk about how to calculate theoretical yields, and talk about the next reaction we're going to perform before we actually perform it. So now you've seen the actual reaction between magnesium metal and hydrochloric acid. And as we discussed, we went from solid magnesium metal, that shiny metal that Tim caught up, into an aqueous solution, and you may have been able to see the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen gas bubbling out. You can certainly see it in person. I'm not sure how well the camera uh, picked it up, though. So now we want to calculate the theoretical yield of our magnesium chloride, which is in solution. Now, we're never going to determine the actual yield. Said another way, we're never going to actually isolate the magnesium chloride and weigh it, but we could still find the theoretical yield of the magnesium chloride. The first thing I want to point out to you is that in this case, because we did the reaction practically, and we actually saw the magnesium disappear, said another way, we ran out of magnesium, we can be very confident that magnesium was the limiting reagent of this reaction. Now, in the lab manual, you'll find the calculation for 6 milliliters of 3 molar HCl, and you will find that if you do that calculation, you do get uh, find the limiting reagent to be the magnesium metal. But again, visually, we saw that by the magnesium disappearing. So if we use this overall reaction, which I'm just going to write down again um, so that I can have it on the, on the screen uh, while I do the uh, stoichiometry, we're going to uh, be able to determine the theoretical yield of our magnesium chloride. Later on in this video, uh, Tim will demonstrate how you can actually do this using um, Excel because you're going to have three flasks and you don't want to have to do this every single time for slightly different masses of magnesium. It's very unlikely that you're going to be able to put 0 0.1070 grams of magnesium into all three flasks. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to convert from grams of magnesium to moles of magnesium using the molar mass to moles of MgCl2, always to convert from moles of one thing to moles of another, we use a balanced chemical equation, which we for fortunately have, and then finally to grams of MgCl2, again using the molar mass or a periodic table. So in this case, we started with 0 0.1070 grams of magnesium times we want to convert it to moles. So if we look on a periodic table, we find that 24.31 grams of magnesium, which we want on the bottom, so the grams of magnesium cancel out, is equal to one mole of magnesium, which we put on the top, times, now we want to convert it to moles of magnesium chloride. Always to convert from moles of one thing to moles of another, we use a balanced chemical equation. We want moles of magnesium on the bottom so it'll cancel out. So we look at the balanced chemical equation and we find that one mole of magnesium is equal to one mole of magnesium chloride. Finally, we want to convert to grams of magnesium chloride. Again, using the molar mass. So we look at a periodic table, magnesium plus chlorine times two. And we find that one mole of magnesium chloride, which again, we want on the bottom, so it'll cancel out, is 95.21 grams of magnesium chloride. And when we do all the math, multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, repeat until you get to the end, we find that we get 0 0.4191 grams of magnesium chloride theoretically in that flask um, where Tim just did the reaction. So now you have an idea of the theoretical yield of magnesium chloride. 
so in the next step of the reaction, we're going to react the magnesium chloride solution that was just made with sodium hydroxide. Okay, so in the exact same container that now contains magnesium chloride, remember we put met uh, the magnesium metal and we turned it into magnesium chloride using the hydrochloric acid, we're going to do a reaction. And in this case, we're going to end up doing a, a double displacement reaction. So magnesium, which is positive, will go with hydroxide, which is negative, and sodium will go with chloride. So if you recall, magnesium's in 2A, so it's 2 plus in ionic compounds, and hydroxide is OH minus. So when we cross these, we find that the formula of magnesium hydroxide is MgOH2, magnesium hydroxide. I will note that magnesium hydroxide is commonly called, if you go to the grocery store, milk of magnesia. Okay, then we have Na going with Cl. Na is plus and Cl is minus, cross the charges, and we get plus NaCl, and that's aqueous. NaCl, as you probably know from common everyday stuff, is soluble in water. But what about magnesium hydroxide? Well, here we need the solubility rules. Hydroxides are generally insoluble. 1A metals and ammonium are exceptions. Magnesium is no exception. So hydroxides are generally insoluble. Magnesium hydroxide is a solid. The final thing we need to do is balance the chemical equation. And if you look here, we have one magnesium, one magnesium, two chlorides, only one chloride. So we need two sodium chlorides. Now, two sodiums, only one sodium. So we need two sodiums and two hydroxides, two hydroxides. Remember when balancing equations with polyatomic ions, it's always a good idea to consider the whole polyatomic ion. Now this doesn't work in all cases because sometimes the polyatomic ion does decompose or turn into something else, but oftentimes this is the easier way to do it. So now we have a balanced chemical equation for the reaction between magnesium chloride and sodium hydroxide. Now for whatever reason, for the sodium hydroxide solution, you can actually use the stock solution um, from the bottle. You don't actually need to dilute it. In future cases, you are going to need to do some dilutions and make some solutions because those are good skills to learn as you're doing these reactions. So in this case, you don't actually need to do it. Um, so you can use the stuff right from the bottle. And specifically, you're going to use 3.5 milliliters of 5.0 molar Na. OH. Now visually, what should you see when this happens? You should go from a clear solution where both, actually two clear solutions, where both solutions have aqueous ions and they're clear and colorless, and you should form magnesium hydroxide solid. We call this a precipitate. And magnesium hydroxide tends to be, or happens to be a white powder, so we should see a white precipitate when we do this reaction. In just a minute, Tim will show you how to do this reaction. To minimize us jumping back and forth, though, I want to do the calculations again with you um, by hand, and then later on we'll show you how to do them by Excel. Now, if we look at this uh, reaction, sodium hydroxide is again used in excess. We could again prove that, but I'm not going to spend the time to prove that. Uh, you could just take our word for it that this is used in excess. So the limiting reagent is actually magnesium chloride. But since the magnesium chloride and the magnesium are one-to-one, -one, we can essentially just use magnesium as the limiting reagent. So ultimately, we started with grams of magnesium. You saw us do that. We used 0 0.1070 grams of magnesium. We want to convert that to moles of magnesium, then to moles of magnesium hydroxide, and then finally to grams of magnesium hydroxide. Again, you're doing this three times and you're gonna have three slightly different masses of magnesium. So this is a lot of math to do by hand. We'll show you how to do that by Excel. It'll make your life easier later on. So in this case, we start with 0 0.1070 grams of magnesium times the molar mass of magnesium is still the same. So for every one mole of magnesium, it is 24.31 grams of magnesium, which we found on the periodic table. 
Now we need to convert from moles of magnesium to moles of magnesium hydroxide. You'll notice that there's no equation here that allows us to do that. But because magnesium chloride and magnesium hydroxide are and magnesium metal, excuse me, were one to one. Magnesium chloride and magnesium hydroxide are also one to one. So for every one mole of magnesium, we get one mole of magnesium hydroxide. Finally, we want to convert to grams of magnesium hydroxide. For every one mole of magnesium hydroxide on the bottom we look up the molar mass on the periodic table um, one magnesium two oxygens and two hydrogens and we find that it's 58.32 grams of magnesium hydroxide so when we do all this math we find that we should make the theoretical yield is 0 0.2567 grams of magnesium hydroxide as our theoretical yield So, what I'm going to do now is show you the reaction between the sodium hydroxide and our previously formed magnesium chloride solution. So I have in this graduated cylinder, I've already measured out our 3.5 milliliters of 5 molar NaOH, and I have in this flask, uh, our same flask from before, where we've already dissolved um, magnesium chloride in the solution. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my sodium hydroxide, and I'm going to pour it directly into my flask. Once it's in there, I'm going to give it a stir, a little spin, and you can see on the camera, uh, I can tell, that it got cloudy. Uh, that cloudiness is the precipitate forming in the solution. That's our magnesium hydroxide, which as Colin just explained to you, is insoluble in solution. Now, there are a couple things to keep in mind when you're performing this part of the experiment. One, make sure all of your flasks are still labeled. Don't accidentally wipe them off or change them so that we know what each of our solutions is. And two, you could have a potential problem of no precip precipitate forming. If no precipitate forms, then there's a fairly simple check you can do to make sure you know why that happened. You can ask your TA for some PA paper, which they have uh, at the front of the room. And in that bottle, you'll find small orange strips of pH paper. Now, if the reaction is not occurring, what that essentially means is that you haven't added enough sodium hydroxide to neutralize all of the HCl that was in excess from our first reaction, uh, so that it can neutralize the HCl and then start reacting with the magnesium chloride that's dissolved in the solution. So if we haven't added enough sodium hydroxide to neutralize all of our HCl, that means we'll still have HCl present. If we still have HCl present, that means the solution will be acidic, which we can test with pH paper. To test the acidity of a solution with pH paper, you don't want to just dip it right in. One, it's easy to drop, and then you leave it in your solution, and now you have to perform your experiment with it in there, and that's no good. And two, you can only use it once, whereas if you do it the way I'm about to show you, you could theoretically use this piece of pH paper two or three times. So what you're going to actually do is you're going to take a glass stirring rod, you're just going to dip that into your solution, and then you're going to touch that glass stirring rod to your pH paper. And in this case, you can see it's turning green. Green, uh, or even blue, it's hard to tell on the camera, um, uh, pH paper means it's a basic solution. If you're unsure what it means, if you look at the bottle of pH paper, you can see on each of the four corners it has a color along with something you probably can't read, but it says what that p color uh corresponds to pH wise. And because we formed precipitate, we know that we've already neutralized all of our uh, HCl in solution uh, so that the NaOH could react with our uh, magnesium chloride. And then as Colin said before, NaOH is uh, used in excess in the solution. So now we have NaOH dissolved in solution, which is basic, which is why our pH paper comes out showing us that the solution is basic. If you didn't form precipitate and checked the pH and found that it was uh, still acidic, all you would have to do is add more sodium hydroxide. It's important to only add as little as you need in order to form your precipitate in the solution, because if you add too much, then that means in the next step when you have to add sulfuric acid, you're going to have to add a huge excess of sulfuric acid as well. So don't just pour in, you know, 30 milliliters of NaOH. Add it a couple milliliters at a time so that you can uh, make sure you don't over basify your solution. 
Now Colin's going to go on, and he's going to talk about the next part of the experiment, where we uh, will react this solution with sulfuric acid. So in the previous section, Tim showed you how to check the pH of the solution if necessary. I just want to point out that if you see a precipitate of um, magnesium hydroxide, if you see that white precipitate, it's not really necessary to check the pH. It's only that you, when, ugh, you only want to check it if you don't see what is expected. So in the next part, what we're going to do is we're going to take that magnesium hydroxide and we're going to react it with some sulfuric acid. And we are, again, going to need to dilute that sulfuric acid. So to make my life um, a little bit easier, I'm going to write the equation kind of in the middle here. And then I go above for to do the dilution and below to do the stoichiometry. So we're going to take magnesium hydroxide that we just formed as a solid in our in our um, container that you just saw, that white uh, precipitate. And we're gonna react it with H2SO4, which is aqueous. So magnesium will go with sulfate in a double displacement reaction, and hydrogen, H plus, will go with OH minus. And we'll get hydrogen hydroxide, which is much more commonly referred to as water. So this is not only a double displacement reaction, but this is also an acid-base reaction. So magnesium is 2 plus and sulfate is 2 minus. When you cross those, you get Mg2SO42. But because they're both 2, we simplify and we get MgSO4. We also get H going with OH and HOH is water. Because we have two H's and two OH's to balance it, we'll get two waters and those will be liquid. Now, if we look at the um, balanced part, we did that. But what about the state of matter? Well, we again need to use our solubility rules. So sulfates are generally in, or excuse me, are generally soluble. There are exceptions such as barium, but magnesium is no exception. So this is aqueous. So what are we going to see visually? We're going to see our white powder disappear, or the solution will reform um, a solution because we have aqueous and we have liquid products. We have no solid product. So we go from a precipitate to a dissolved precipitate, if you will, or said another way, the white powder should disappear. So this is what we're going to do. Now, in order to do this, we need to use two molar sulfuric acid and we need 18 mls of two molar h2so4 but what we have on hand from five molar h2so4 so how are we going to do this well we're going to use c1v1 equals c2v2 where the initial concentration is again five molar the initial volume is something we don't know. And the final uh, concentration is 2 molar. It should be 2.0 molar. And the final volume is 18 milliliters. When you do that math, you find that V1 equals uh, 7.2 milliliters. So we're going to use 7.2 milliliters of 5 molar. H2SO4. And then the rest of the volume, the rest of the 18 milliliters, or 18 minus 7.2, 10.8 milliliters of water. So what are you going to do? You're again going to add the acid to the water. So you're going to measure out 10.8 milliliters of water, mix in 7.2 milliliters of the 5 molar H2SO4. And then in each case, you're going to add 6 milliliters so one third of it, six milliliters of the H2SO4 to each of the three flasks containing magnesium hydroxide. Again, in our demonstrations, we're only doing one flask, but when you're actually doing this, you're gonna use all four flasks, or all three flasks, sorry, not four. So what we need to do next is we need to figure out the theoretical yield of the um, magnesium sulfate. In order to do that, because everything here is one-to-one -one stoichiometry, we're actually going to again start with the original um, magnesium. So we started with 0 0.1070 grams of magnesium. We're going to again, as we've done twice before, convert it to moles. 
for every one mole of magnesium, it has a mass of 24.31 grams of magnesium. The stoichiometry is again one to one. For every magnesium, we'll get one magnesium sulfate. So we put one mole of magnesium on the bottom and one mole of MgSO4 on top. Notice that that didn't come exactly from this reaction. It came from a series of reactions that were essentially added together. We're not going to get into how to add those together. If you know that the stoichiometry is one to one, this does work. Then we're going to finally convert it to grams of magnesium sulfate by finding the molar mass of magnesium sulfate. And we find that for every one mole of magnesium sulfate, it has a mass of 58.32 grams of, in this case, magnesium sulfate. When you do all that math, you find that theoretically we should have 5, 0.5298 grams of magnesium sulfate in the solution. So now what I'm going to do is turn it back over to Tim, who's going to actually show you how, uh, what this is you're visually going to see, which again is a solid turning into an aqueous solution. Said another way, it will appear as if the solid disappears. So as Colin said, I'm going to show you the reaction of our magnesium hydroxide solution with our sulfuric acid. I measured out our 18 milliliters of diluted sulfuric acid in a 25 milliliter graduated cylinder, and I placed the six that we're going to use for our reaction into a smaller one so that I can add it to our reaction flask. So I'm going to take our six milliliters of sulfuric acid, I'm going to pour it into the flask, and you should see on the camera it disappears. The solid within the solution appears to disappear, which, as Colin said, is because we're going from an insoluble magnesium hydroxide to a soluble magnesium sulfate. So we expect there to be no precipitate in the solution, and there is not. Just like last time, if the expected result doesn't occur, you can uh, test why that is using pH paper. If we still had uh, solute um, floating in the solution, if we still had magnesium hydroxide in the solution, we could check the pH with pH paper, and if we found the solution was still basic, said another way, if we found that we had not added enough sulfuric acid to neutralize all of our NaOH, then we would know that we needed to add more sulfuric acid to the solution in order to overcome the NaOH and begin the reaction with the magnesium hydroxide in the solution. But luckily, because we see that there is no precipitate, we know we don't need to do that, and we don't need to add any more sulfuric acid to the solution. So now we're ready to perform our final reaction, where we're going to react this magnesium sulfate with a sodium carbonate solution, which Colin will describe for you in a minute, uh, and then we'll come back and I'll show you how we're going to do that, and then how we're going to work up our solution at the end of the experiment. So in this last step, we're finally going to add sodium carbonate to our magnesium sulfate. So in this case, we have magnesium sulfate, which is aqueous, reacting with sodium carbonate, which is aqueous. And again, it's a double displacement reaction. Magnesium goes with carbonate and magnesium um, is two plus and carbonate is two minus. So we end up with, when we simplify, MgCO3. And sodium goes with sulfate, Na is plus one, sulfate is two minus. So we end up with Na2SO4, which is aqueous, all right? 1A metals are always aqueous and sulfate is no exception. So here we're gonna form magnesium carbonate. Magnesium carbonate and carbonates in general are insoluble. So this will again precipitate. And this time we're actually gonna collect the precipitate by filtration, which Tim will show you in a minute and find the actual yield. Then to find the percentage yield, we're gonna take the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield and multiply by 100%. In just a minute, I'll show you how to calculate the um, theoretical yield. Then Tim will show you how to calculate the actual yield, and then in Excel, we'll actually calculate the percentage yield for you. So before we do that, though, we do need to um, make a sodium carbonate solution. And sodium carbonate, again, I said carbonates are generally insoluble, but 1A metals are always soluble. So sodium carbonate is a soluble carbonate compound. So what are we going to do to do that? Well, we're going to make 70, I should put that on the screen, 70 milliliters of one molar Na2CO3. 
In order to do that, we want to go from liters of Na2CO3 to moles of Na2CO3 to grams of Na2CO3. So in this case, we're starting with 70 milliliters, but we have to convert that to liters. 0 0.070 liters of Na2CO3 solution. And we want it to be one molar. So for every one liter of Na2, one liter of Na2CO3, we should have one mole of sodium carbonate because one molar means one mole per liter. So one mole per one liter. So we should have one mole of Na2CO3 times the molar mass of sodium carbonate on the top. So we need one mole of Na2CO3 on the bottom so that moles cancel out. And on top, we need the molar mass, which is 105.99 grams of Na2CO3. All right, and when we do all that math, we get 7.42 grams of Na2CO3. To make this solution, we take 7.42 grams of Na2CO3 and we add 70 milliliters of water. Note that it will be slightly less than one molar because the volume will be slightly greater than 70 milliliters. When we added seven grams, that's kind of a lot. Um, so the volume will increase slightly. Don't worry about that. It'll be close enough to one molar and we're gonna use it in huge excess. We're then gonna take 20 milliliters of that sodium carbonate solution that we just made. All right, not all 70 in one flask, but 20 in each flask. There's three flasks, as you recall. And we're gonna add it to the aqueous magnesium sulfate. And when we do that, we should see a precipitate. Now, one note that I just came to my mind is, if you're watching these videos, and maybe this isn't the first one you've watched, if you write this kind of stuff down, okay, as you watch the video, you will learn it more quickly. So this kind of thing could be on a test, okay, not in the lab, but it could be on the lab test even, but especially in the lecture, if you write these things out instead of just watching them, you will learn them much faster. So just a tip. All right, now what are we going to do? We're gonna figure out how much of this solid magnesium carbonate we can make. Said another way, we're gonna figure out our the theoretical yield. We're gonna do the exact same thing. We're gonna convert from grams of magnesium to grams of magnesium carbonate. We can do that because all the stoichiometry is one to one. We're essentially just adding the reactions together. So in this case, we're gonna start with our same 0 0.1070 grams of magnesium. We're gonna convert it to moles of magnesium as we've done every time before by putting one mole of magnesium on the top and putting 24.31 grams of magnesium on the bottom. All the stoichiometry is one to one. So for every one mole of magnesium, the limiting reagent, we're gonna make one mole of magnesium carbonate, the white precipitate that we're actually gonna filter out and isolate and weigh. So in this case, we actually need this theoretical yield to calculate the percentage yield. And again, the percentage yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100%. Finally, we're gonna use the molar mass of the magnesium carbonate. So for every one mole of magnesium carbonate, it's gonna have a mass of 84.31 grams of magnesium carbonate. And for our particular sample, the theoretical yield is 0 0.37 one one grams of magnesium carbonate. All right, you're gonna do this three times because you're gonna have slightly different masses of magnesium. You're gonna get slightly different yields of magnesium carbonate. Then as I mentioned before, we're gonna find the percent yield, which Tim will show you how to do on Excel in just a little while. And that is the actual yield, which we're actually going to isolate uh, by filtration, the magnesium carbonate that precipitates when we perform this uh, reaction. And we're going to um, use that as the actual yield. And we're gonna put that over the theoretical yield, which is right here. And we're gonna multiply that by 100 and we're gonna find our percentage yield. Then, as we've done before, we're gonna find the standard deviation and the relative standard deviation, and we're gonna comment on the precision of our results. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Tim, who's gonna show you how exactly 
um, we can perform this reaction. We are not going to show you how to make the sodium carbonate solution. We kind of give you a recipe, 7.42 grams of sodium carbonate in 70 milliliters. This is for everybody, so you can use this. Note that it doesn't need to be exactly 7.42. It could be 7.3 or 7.6. Don't use 27, but it just needs to be in that ballpark. As Colin described, I'm going to show you uh, the reaction between the sodium carbonate solution and our magnesium sulfate solution. So I've already gone ahead and made our sodium carbonate solution, and you'll notice it's nice and clear. Uh, that took a little while. You have to really stir the solution in order to ensure all of your sodium carbonate dissolves in solution, because if you don't, you're going to have um, different amounts of sodium carbonate in your solutions that you add to your flasks when you uh, separate it into your 20 milliliter aliquots. So it's really important that you stir the sodium carbonate solution, the full 70 milliliters, uh, a lot in order to dissolve it all. Uh, all I did was just take it and do this for a little while. Uh, it took maybe about five minutes of stirring for it all to dissolve. Once it's all dissolved, you can get your 20 milliliter aliquot, and you're going to take your 20 milliliter aliquot, and you're just going to pour it directly into your magnesium uh, sulfate solution. You notice a lot of bubbles may form uh, when you initially perform that reaction, and you're going to stir it up just to make sure it's nice and mixed, but you notice a problem. We don't have our magnesium carbonate uh, precipitate forming in solution. In order to form our magnesium carbonate precipitate, we're going to need to heat up the solution. So once I've mixed my sodium carbonate solution and my uh, magnesium sulfate uh, solution, I put it onto this hot plate for a little while. What I did was I turned the hot plate up to about 350 degrees. Uh, I've turned it off now and unplugged it because I'm done using it and I don't need to keep it hot afterwards. But we'll turn this up to about 350 degrees, put our flask on, and let it heat. Every 30 seconds or so, I picked it up, give it a little swirl to make sure it stays nice and uh, uniformly heated, and I let it heat until it began to boil. Once it began to boil, I can turn down my hot plate because I don't need to get any hotter, and I let it boil for a couple of minutes. As it boiled, uh, I started to form precipitate, which you can clearly see in the video. Um, even before it began to boil, uh, the precipitate started to form, but I let it get up to uh, a boil and let it boil for a couple of minutes to ensure all of my precipitate formed in my solution. Once that is done, uh, I turned off the hot plate, and you can take the flask off of the hot plate, but please be very careful. Uh, you've had boiling water in there for the last couple of minutes. It's going to be very hot. Odds are you don't want to grab it with your bare hand. You'll want to use a pair of tongs or a paper towel to move it off of the hot plate so that it stays, uh, so that it can cool down safely. And of course, make sure you're wearing gloves so you're not touching hot glass with your fingers directly. In the event that you don't see precipitate form by the time it's boiled for a minute, it's possible that your solution has not got enough sodium carbonate in it, uh, which we can test like we tested the previous solutions. You're going to just take a stirring rod and test the solution for uh, its pH on a piece of pH paper, because sodium carbonate is a basic solution. Once you've added enough sodium carbonate to neutralize all of the sulfuric acid that may have been left over from the previous step, and you start to add excess uh, sodium carbonate that can actually react with the magnesium sulfate, the solution will become more and more basic. So if you test the pH of the solution and you find that it's still acidic, uh, because you haven't gotten any precipitate formed and you tested it, and you find that it's still acidic, you just need to add a little bit more sodium carbonate solution until the solution becomes basic. Once the solution has become basic, you can put it back on the hot plate and let it heat again until it boils for a couple of minutes, at which time you will have plenty of precipitate and you can uh, move on to the next step uh, to collect your filtrate. So once you've formed your precipitate and you have it sitting in the bottom of your flask, you're going to need to collect your precipitate, rinse it, dry it, and measure your final mass. So you're going to need a bunch of things for this part. The first thing you're going to need is a filtration apparatus setup. For that setup, you're going to need a ring stand. You're going to need a three-prong three clamp. You're going to need a filtration flask, which is a 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask that has this glass piece on the end. 
you're going to need a piece of thick rubber vacuum tubing, which you have hooked up to one of the vacuum uh, nozzles underneath the hood, which you can see sticking out over the end here. I have it hooked up to one on the other side, so uh, you can't see it hooked up, but it is hooked up to one of the ones labeled VAC for vacuum. They're the yellow uh, nozzles underneath the bench. You're also going to need a Buchner funnel, which is one of these plastic funnels, and the bottom half, which has a rubber stopper as well. As far as the drying is concerned, you're going to need two things. You're going to need filter paper, and you're going to need a watch glass. So we're going to do uh, a handful of things here, and I'm going to show you each one at a time. So the first thing we're going to do is we need to measure the mass of our filter paper. We have to measure the mass of the filter paper because in a minute it's going to be covered in our final product, and we're not going to be able to get it all off. So the easiest way to measure the mass of our final product is to measure the mass of this filter paper, then put the product on it, and then measure the mass of the filter paper with the product and subtract out the initial mass of the product. We're going to do that by, once we've filtered it onto the filter paper, we're going to put all three of our flasks on a single watch glass. When we do that, we need to be able to differentiate each of our three filter papers because each one will be from a solution that has a different amount of uh, initial uh, magnesium. So on the watch glass on the bottom, we're going to write one, two, and three to differentiate each of our three flasks so that when I put my filter paper down, I'm putting it on one of those numbers so I know which one of my three flasks it was. Once I have all three filter papers on this flask, you're going to take it to the hood and you're going to put it underneath the heat lamp so that you can dry your samples. But first we need to actually collect our samples. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this part of the Buchner funnel and I'm going to put it on there. I'm going to give it a nice firm push down. You don't need to push with all your might because you'll break the glass or get it stuck there forever, but giving it a nice firm push so that it doesn't really move much when you wiggle it. Next, we're going to take the other half of the Buchner funnel, we're going to put that right on top, and we're going to take our piece of filter paper, which I measured the mass to be 0 0.2366 grams, and I'm going to put that right into my uh, filter flat, or my Buchner funnel. So I'm going to take a little bit of water and I'm just going to pour that on there a little bit before I turn my vacuum on in order to wet the filter paper so that it sticks to the bottom of my Buchner funnel. Next, I'm going to turn on my vacuum and you can turn it on as high as you need. And when you do that, you can't see it on the camera, but you'll see the water get pulled down uh, that I just poured on into my filter flask. Now there's a vacuum here, and if you put your hand over top, you can feel it pull a little bit on your hand, um, but be careful doing that. And we can filter out our product. So to do that, all we're gonna do is we're gonna take it and we're just gonna pour our product, including the solid and liquid, onto our Buchner funnel. And as you can see on the camera, it starts to run through, the liquid at least, it starts to run through the uh, Buchner funnel and the filter paper and collect in the bottom. Uh, it takes it a couple of seconds to pull all of our liquid through, but once it does so, you can tell uh, looking down into the Buchner funnel uh, from the top, you can see that the uh, water is all gone. You'll also notice that it stops dripping uh, through the filter flask, and we've collected our product on the filter paper. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of water, we're going to pour that into our reaction flask, and we're going to do that just so that we can guarantee that any extra small amounts of product that may have been left over get pulled into our solution as well. So we just do a little rinse, and we pour that on here as well. So we wait for that to get pulled through, uh, which only takes a second. And now we have one last thing to do before we bring our filter paper over to the uh, heat lamp on our watch glass, and that's going to use a small amount of acetone. We use a small amount of acetone because that'll help separate the water a little bit further, because the water isn't soluble in the acetone, uh, in order to help dry out our uh, product. So first we're going to turn off our vacuum, so that we no longer have a vacuum being pulled. So once we do that, we're just going to take our filter off of our Buchner funnel off of here just to break the vacuum so that we don't have a vacuum still formed. Then we're going to take a very small amount of our acetone and we're just going to spray the top of it gently. I'm only going to use one squeeze with maybe two milliliters of acetone. You don't need a lot. The idea is just to get a little bit on there. So I'm just going to take it and I'm just going to do that. And that's plenty of acetone. 
You don't need a lot. There's no reason to use a ton of it, but you're just going to do that so that you can help get rid of that last little bit of water that is stubbornly sticking to it. Once you squirt it, you're going to need to turn on your vacuum again. So we turn on our vacuum one more time. Um, one second. Okay, there goes my vacuum. And we're just going to let that pull the acetone off of our sample, which takes a second. You'll again be able to tell it'll stop dripping, uh, which it looks like it stopped dripping. So we're going to turn off our vacuum one last time. And now our sample is ready to be brought over to the uh, uh, hood. It is important that we are careful when using acetone because acetone is a flammable substance so we want to make sure it's not near any open flames or sources of heat. So make sure you're keeping it away from any still hot hot plates or the heat lamp uh, or anything like that. Uh, make sure it's just kept uh, nice and isolated so you don't accidentally start any fires. So once we are done we're going to take our uh, top of our beaker funnel off. We're going to use a spatula and we're going to use that to dig at the side of the filter paper to pick up our filter paper. And once we have our filter paper, we're going to place that onto our watch glass. And now we can take this watch glass over to the heat lamp to dry it. When you do this, of course, you'll have three different uh, filter papers on here that you've each filtered uh, through the filter flask and you'll dry all three simultaneously again being sure to weigh the filter paper beforehand and labeling our three spots on the watch glass so that we know which filter paper goes with which initial mass of magnesium. So now that we've gone over all the experimental things that we need to do I'm going to show you how to do all the math Colin did and how to calculate your percent yield and your actual yield in Excel. So here I have my entire Excel sheet filled out. Uh, the only numbers that are going to change uh, that we enter from uh, uh, trial to trial is this number here, which is our initial mass of magnesium, along with our mass of filter paper, which we have to measure for each trial, and the mass of the filter paper and MgCO3 once it's dried that you can find here. We've already uh, finished drying my sample of magnesium carbonate and put it in here. And in this video, I'm only gonna have one trial, uh, not three trials like you will in the lab. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna calculate the theoretical yield of each of our uh, steps of this reaction. So the first thing we're gonna calculate is the theoretical yield of magnesium chloride. So to do that, we're gonna start with our mass of magnesium and we're gonna convert that to moles of magnesium by dividing by the molar mass, which I've entered here. Then once I do that, the next step is technically to multiply by one mole of uh, magnesium chloride per one mole of magnesium, but since that's multiplying by one and dividing by one, I'm just going to skip that in Excel. It's silly to type times one divided by one. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to do is multiply by the molar mass. So this is the exact same math that Colin did on paper, and I'm just doing it in Excel. All of these molar masses came from uh, the periodic table, all four of these and this one. And this mass of magnesium is just the mass of magnesium that I measured at the beginning of the experiment. So once I have my mass of magnesium divided by my molar mass of magnesium times the molar mass of my product, I'm just going to hit enter and it's going to give me the theoretical yield with, of course, way more significant figures than we would realistically have. Uh, in real life, we have four sig figs. This should actually be one number over. I did measure 0 0.1070. So this we would round to four sig figs as well, which I will do by clicking this little button over here, which changes the number of uh, decimal points. And now we have our four significant figures that we should have for this experiment. So now we need to do the same thing for the magnesium hydroxide, the magnesium sulfate, and the magnesium carbonate. But there's an easier way than uh, having to do it for each one. So what I can do is, for each of these steps, if you'll remember, Colin started by taking the mass of magnesium and divided by the molar mass of magnesium, and then in the end he just multiplied by each of the molar masses of our products. So if we're going to do the same first two steps for each of these parts, we can make Excel do that for us. To do that, we go into that cell uh, value, which in this case is cell A3, the blue box for the blue number, and we press F4. When we do that, it puts these dollar symbols in, which essentially tells Excel that we want to use exactly the same cell each time. We also want to use exactly the molar mass of magnesium each time, so we go into the middle of our B3, our red cell, our red number, and we press F4 again. Now, if I drag this uh, cell downward, 
those cells will stay the same, and only the purple cell will change each time, the purple cell being the molar mass of our product. So as I drag it down, the molar mass of our product will change by being dragged down as well, which will update uh, our calculation so that for each one, it's determining the molar, the theoretical yield of that product by converting the mass of magnesium to moles of magnesium to moles of our product. And luckily for us, this also calculates our theoretical yield of magnesium carbonate, which is the last thing we need in order to determine our percent yield. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this number, our actual yield of magnesium carbonate, we're going to press equals, we're just going to click on that cell, and it's going to copy and paste it in for us. You could also just copy and paste it yourself if you'd prefer. Last thing we need to do is we need to actually calculate our percent yield. So to do that, if you remember, uh, Colin already, um, sorry, I actually uh, messed up on this cell. This cell is not that. This is our actual yield of magnesium carbonate, not our theoretical yield. So our actual yield of magnesium carbonate is going to be the filter paper plus magnesium carbonate minus the mass of our filter paper. I apologize. So we're going to take our larger number, subtract our smaller number, and that'll give us our actual yield of magnesium carbonate. In this case, 0 0.3350 grams. Now we need to calculate our percent yield. To calculate percent yield, we're going to take our actual yield. We're going to divide that by our theoretical yield, which we find over here. That's where this number comes in. And we multiply by 100 because percent yield is a percent. So we have to multiply by 100 to turn it into a percent. And we find that our percent yield was 90.2748, etc. Uh, for our percent yield. Again, we want to reduce that to only four significant figures or so. Uh, so we have 90.27%. The last thing we're going to need to do is the uh, experiment asks you to determine the average percent yield, the standard deviation of our percent yields, and our relative standard deviation. So to do that, we're going to have to copy each of our three trials over here by, for trial one and under percent yield, pressing equals and clicking that cell so it'll copy it over for us. We would also do that for trials two and three, which I don't have here, but you would in the labs. And then we need to calculate the average in uh, our standard deviations. So to calculate the average, we press equals, we type average, we'll select our three values, we close our parentheses and press enter. For standard deviation, we do STDEV, we open our parentheses, we select our three values, we close our number, we press enter. In this case, we're going to get a divide by zero error because I don't have numbers entered here. So I'm just going to enter in some fake numbers in order to give us three different values um, so that our standard deviation gives us an actual number. And the last thing we need to do is determine our relative standard deviation, which in this class we do in parts per thousand, which we indicate here with the PPT. So we take our standard deviation, we divide that by our average, and we multiply by 1,000, because again, we do parts per 1,000, and we get all of our values for uh, the statistical analysis we're required to do in this lab. Again, you're not going to make up your trial 2 and 3 numbers, you're actually going to perform the experiment three times uh, to get your three different values. We hope that this uh, video has helped you uh, know exactly what you're doing in the experiment. Uh, again, I want to reiterate, please make sure you're labeling your flasks and your watch glass throughout the experiment so that you know which of your masses go with which of your filter papers and which of your flasks, because otherwise it becomes impossible to get good results at the end of the experiment. So. I hope that the video helped you. Hopefully the Excel uh, will help you to better perform and more efficiently perform your calculations uh, so that you don't have to do them all by hand and uh, you will be able to perform this lab with no problems. So as a thank you for um, watching this entire video, we just briefly wanted to go over the um, hypothesis. So I'm not gonna write the hypothesis verbally or anything like this. Instead, I'm just gonna talk about each of these things um, and just remind you about where you might find what they're, um, where you might find the answers. In the future, and I've said this before, what is a good thing to do is take a look at what's gonna be provided uh, required for the hypothesis and try to pick these things out as you go through the video. But here we'll go through it at the end. So sentence one should contain the following. A specific prediction of the amount of magnesium carbonate that will be obtained in grams. So this is about 0.33 grams. Said another way, it's a theoretical yield. The initial amount of magnesium that will be used is around 0.1 grams. 
Sentence two should contain the following. The chemical that magnesium will re be reacted with first, that is hydrochloric acid. This is a single replacement reaction where uh, magnesium replaces hydrogen in HCl. Uh, the state of matter of the product of the first reaction is aqueous because we're going to form magnesium chloride. The chemical that the magnesium chloride will be reacted with is sodium hydroxide. And this is a double displacement reaction or a double replacement reaction. Or even if you wanted, this is in... Um, a precipitation reaction but probably double displacement or double replacement is better and the state of the matter of the product of the final react uh, the second reaction excuse me will be a solid because magnesium hydroxide is insoluble hydroxides are generally insoluble sentence three should contain the following the chemical that magnesium hydroxide will be reacted with and that is sulfuric acid this is again a double displacement reaction. It is technically also an acid base reaction. Uh, the state of the matter of the third product, magnesium sulfate, is aqueous because sulfate salts are generally soluble and magnesium is no exception. Finally, the magnesium sulfate will be reacted with sodium carbonate. All right. And this is again a double displacement reaction. And the magnesium carbonate, which is actually the stuff that gymnasts, that white powder that gymnasts put on their hands, um, is a solid. So I hope this gives you a little bit of an idea of the hypothesis. And I do appreciate you watching the video.